Hello and welcome everyone. On behalf of Questrade, I want to thank you for attending today's webinar on investing in the greater good. We're very excited to introduce you to Tim Nash, founder of Good Investing, who will walk you through some of the fundamentals of socially responsible investing today. Now, before we get started, I just have two quick housekeeping items to touch on. First, today's webinar will be recorded and we will email a link to everyone who signed up. So watch out for that in your email inbox later this week. Second, we will save some time for Q&A at the end today. So if you have any questions for Tim, please submit them into the chat window and we'll ask them at the end on your behalf and we'll get to as many as we can. Now, with that out of the way, uh, let's get into it. Uh, Tim, take it away. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, huge thanks to Questrade. They've been a, a wonderful partner in this. So really happy to be here and uh, kind of excited to, to chat with everyone today about socially responsible investing. Um, I'll give a quick background on myself just so that people kind of know who they're dealing with here. Uh, so my name is Tim Nash. Uh, I grew up in London, Ontario with my father in the investment industry. So I sort of grew up around stocks and bonds. Uh, from there, I studied economics and philosophy uh, out at Dalhousie University in Halifax. So I was kind of the, the weird one in each of those faculties asking the strange questions. Um, and really, as I was learning the economic models uh, uh, in sort of traditional uh, economic classes, the philosopher in me was always kind of asking a lot of bigger questions like, wait a minute, you know, something's off here. I describe it as almost sort of my spidey sense was tingling, like I knew something was missing. I just couldn't quite put my finger on it. Um, so I graduated with my BA in economics with way more questions than I actually had answers. So I went to Sweden and I did my master's in sustainability. And this was back in 2007, 2008, before the term sustainability really had sort of caught on. Uh, um, and, and really, this was a, a very early uh, view of systems thinking, uh, looking at engineering for a sustainable society, so all these different green technologies. And for my thesis, I looked at this topic of socially responsible investing. Um, as I was doing my research and talking to potential experts and everyone in the field, you know, something kept popping up, which was this assumption that you had to sacrifice financial returns in order to invest in cord according to your values. So that kind of stuck out to me because I was like, wait a minute, something there doesn't quite seem right. And I'm going to be uh, diving into that, into the presentation today. But needless to say that that was my thesis about 12 years ago, uh, this idea of uh, the financial materiality of sustainability issues. Uh, I came back to Canada in July of 2008, ready to take the investment world by storm. Uh, my timing was remarkable. I graduated right into the crash. So obviously, that was a very hard time to find a job in the investment industry. And certainly, this whole concept of socially responsible or sustainable investing very much got put on the back burner. So that's when I created my first business. Uh, I called it Strategic Sustainable Investments. Uh, really, my focus was helping institutions and some of the larger uh, uh, foundations and pensions to be able to look at this uh, concept of responsible investing. I did have a little bit of success. Uh, I helped the Catherine Donnelly Foundation. It's about a $40 million uh, private foundation here in Canada. Uh, they completely divested from fossil fuels back in, I think it was 2013 would be my guess, certainly before the first big oil crash. But needless to say, I was probably too early. Uh, uh, the, the big institutions weren't quite ready for these ideas. So really sort of struggled with that first business. Uh, that's when I pivoted and uh, I created my blog, sustainableeconomist.com, and went after a much more retail focus. Uh, I published some model portfolios uh, that I'll be re referring to today. And that also uh, just really started writing about these issues, kind of being that, that sort of, you know, whatever uh, influencer, I guess, would be the business model. I uh, didn't pay all my bills, so I did teach intro to micro and intro to macro economics at Sheridan College during that time. This was sort of more of my side hustle. But as interest kept growing in sustainable investing, more and more people kept asking me, Tim, how do I actually do this? I love what you're talking about. I like the theory, but how do I actually invest my money? So that was uh, probably in about 2018, so about two years ago. I sort of took the plunge. I, I quit my uh, teaching job at Sheridan and I launched Good Investing. And really, uh, uh, I'm on a mission to help as many people as I can actually implement these approaches. Uh, I'm basically a fee-for-service financial planner and really here to help people figure this stuff out and whatever barriers they're facing, 
um, you know, help them through those barriers and, and to get to the point where they actually are able to invest their money uh, in a socially responsible way. So, you know, really this presentation, I'm going to be giving a, an overview. You know, I am going to try to get through my slides fairly quick. Really, I, I love the Q&A. If people do have questions, uh, I'd love to engage the chat and, and really, uh, you know, dive into some of these issues uh, uh, in a more practical manner. So let's get started with the presentation. Uh, let me just see here. Here we go. So I'm kind of assuming that most people here, if you're uh, uh, on Questrade's mailing list and have signed up, that you've probably heard of a couch potato portfolio, this idea of passive index investing. I would say this is really sort of like the default way to go. If you're a do-it-yourself investor that's still a little bit nervous, you know, certainly you don't want to be a day trader. You want to invest for the long term. This couch potato portfolio is a, a great place for people to, to be able to start uh, when it comes to investing their own money. And, and so really, this is kind of the template. This is the model I was really inspired by Dan Bartolotti and the Canadian couch potato um, in, in creating these very uh, uh, standard portfolios. From there, you know, what I do is when I talk about a sustainable portfolio, it is going to look very, very similar. You're still going to have your mix of traditional stocks and bonds. You're still going to have this nice geographic diversification. But you can see that I've added in two little slices of the pie. Uh, the first is for green stocks. So we'll talk about this. But this is going out of our way to sort of do more good, to invest in things that we really believe in. For example, uh, uh, renewable energy, clean technologies, water infrastructure, things like that. And then also this uh, uh, little blue section for impact investing. And that's where I get really, really excited about that. I will be touching on some of these uh, uh, um, products a little bit later. But really, you know, I want to be clear that I'm not deviating too far. I'm not saying to do, do something completely different from that couch potato. Really, what we want to do is be a little bit more deliberate about our traditional investments. So when it comes to our bonds, when it comes to our stocks, I'll use what I call a, a sort of do less harm approach where really what we're trying to do is, is avoid the things that, that people really don't want inside their portfolio. Um, and then it's really going to be through these green stocks and through this idea of impact investing that we're able to have a really nice, big, positive impact. Um, so when we talk about doing less harm and what that means and when it comes to our broad-based uh, 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 um, equity ETFs, there's a really important acronym that you need to understand, which is ESG or environmental, social, and governance data. So this is a huge acronym right now. Lots of articles, lots of talk about this on TV. ESG is a very hot trend right now. And really when it comes to this environmental, social, governance data, what we're doing is bringing an additional lens to our security selection. So there are different companies that have this ESG data. I'll show you a couple of different options. The first one I'm showing you here is from MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital Indices. This is a very big, large, traditional uh, uh, company. They build a lot of the uh, indexes that some of the most popular ETFs in the world are based on. So this is a data provider. They provide data on all these publicly traded companies. They're also an index provider. So they build indexes, which then can be turned into ETFs. So this is a, an ESG rating report for Apple. I chose Apple just because it's like the biggest company in the world right now. It's massive. I wonder if it's hit $2 trillion today. I know it's very, very close uh, to that mark. So I just went with Apple because it is the biggest, but we could get this information with basically any publicly traded company. You can see that uh, they do have this sort of ESG rating up here. You can see that Apple is rated single A. So the most sustainable rating, the, the, the company that would very much be a leader in this space would be rated triple A, and then double A, and then single A is okay. You know, certainly they're not the worst. Once you get in triple B, double B, single B, and then obviously triple C, that's where you would have companies that just really aren't reporting at all, where they just, we have no idea where they stand on a lot of these issues, or, you know, perhaps they're facing some pretty major controversies at this time that is getting them such a low rating. Um, there's a lot of research and data points that go into these ESG ratings. Uh, they are available for free. This sort of overview is available for free. If I wanted the really technical details, I, I would need to pay for that MSCI subscription. But, you know, even with this free information, it does give me a pretty good sense of Apple, you know, triple A rated. I can see that they're not a laggard in any major issues, which is nice. You know, if they were, if there were any major controversies 
or they were a massive laggard from within their sector, then that would pop up here. For the most part, Apple is sort of fairly average, you know, which an A rating would suggest uh, that they're average when it comes to corporate governance. Um, these, this is going to be the governance structure of the, uh, structure of the company. Things like say on pay, um, things like uh, is there separation between chair of the board and the CEO, uh, things like percentage of women on the board of directors. These are all going to be corporate governance issues. Uh, they're also average when it comes to human capital development. This is really going to be how well they're treating their employees in terms of you know hiring, training them. Do they ha have high turnover or are uh, employees more loyal and have opportunities to grow within the company? Uh, privacy and data security, obviously very important in Apple sector. Uh, supply chain labor standards. So Apple would have been nailed for this a few years ago. Uh, there was a major controversy with a factory in China. I believe it was an assembly plant uh, run by a third party uh, contractor called Foxconn. And Foxconn just really was treating their employees uh, uh, very poorly to the point where employees were threatening suicide and the company had to install nets around the factory to prevent employees from jumping out the windows. It's, it's absolutely tragic what was happening at Foxconn and Apple you know, was very much a part of that. So that would have been a major controversy at that time. Obviously Apple took a huge hit to their reputation and now is forced to improve their supply chain labor standards. I wouldn't consider them a leader in this space, but they are certainly now at least average. As well, they are average when it comes to electronic waste, huge problem in the tech sector. You know, what do you do with your phone? You know, Apple, I don't think has the, the best sort of recovery and recycling rate. Uh, where they are leaders is opportunities in clean tech. So Apple, uh, they launched, uh, I think they issued a billion dollar green bond. So they raised a billion dollars to fund renewable energy projects that, that now run all of their, I believe it's all of their US operations are sort of essentially run by renewable energy, uh, or at least they have as much renewable energy flowing into the grid as they are taking from the grid. Uh, from there, they are also a leader when it comes to controversial sourcing. So this is gonna be things like conflict minerals, right? Obviously when it comes to tech, this would be a huge reputational risk to Apple. If it did turn out that they were sourcing conflict minerals, in their iPhones, I think that would be a major problem uh, for their consumers. So they are a leader in that space. So this just kind of like gives you an overview when it comes to Apple, you know, what are the things that we're looking at? You can see that this is a mix of environmental issues, things like clean tech, right? Um, carbon emissions, water use, waste, all that stuff is gonna be in here. Social issues, which is how we're treating our employees and our supply chains, um, and then also governance issues. So how the company is being managed and run. So these are all things that are very, very important to a company's uh, 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 performance and, and really how sort of sustainable that company is, both from a financial perspective and from an ethical perspective. Now, MSCI isn't the only company that does these ratings. Uh, there is another large company called Sustainalytics. Recently, they got bought by Morningstar, which is really exciting because Morningstar is huge when it comes to this. So I am expecting a lot of these ESG ratings to now be incorporated into the Morningstar analysis, which is fantastic. But again, you can see here Apple, you can see how it's done here. They're considered medium risk. In this case, a lower score is better, is sort of lower risk, but they really are looking at it through this risk lens. You know, know that there are a few different ESG data providers that do have different methodologies. And this is a, a problem for a lot of people when it comes to this idea of sustainable investing is that there isn't consensus yet on this idea of ESG data and analysis that there are different approaches. So to me, it's fine. I like that there are different approaches. I think, you know, when I look at a, a, an analyst covering a company, I want some company, some analysts that think it's a, a buy and some that think it's a sell. I think that having, you know, those different methodologies can be important, but just know that it can get a little bit confusing because what is considered a, a leader by one ESG data firm might not necessarily be a leader across the board and know that there is a lot of work to be done in terms of making this ESG data, uh, both relevant to investors, but also to, uh, uh, you know, I think the broad public that helping people to understand what is a, a very complex analysis that goes into this. Um, so, you know, really now that we understand this idea of ESG analysis, there are a huge number of ETFs in the market right now that incorporate ESG into their decision-making methodology. 
So this is going to be both through uh, uh, what we call negative screening, which is getting rid of companies. So they might get rid of things like tobacco or weapons or fossil fuels as well that I would expect that a lot of these uh, uh, indices are uh, using ESG data when it comes to determining which companies are in, which companies are out, and also the weightings of those uh, the companies within those ETFs. So you can see here, this is just the Canadian equity ETFs. So there's like three from iShares, two from Desjardins, one from BMO. There are more that have been launched since I built this slide. Well, Simple came out with their uh, socially responsible ETFs. So there is really a wide range of options. When we look at U.S. equities, it gets even wider. But really the idea here is that each of these funds is going to use a different methodology when it comes to this idea of ESG. Uh, um, that, that really it's important for investors to understand that there are a wide range of options. And it's really about looking at the methodology, understanding what those exclusions are, what they sort of kick out of the fund, but also how they're integrating ESG issues into, into the, that security selection to figure out you know, which one is the right fit for you. And obviously there are trade-offs that as we do look at the most sustainable ETFs, that they typically kick out the most companies, meaning that they are less diversified. So know that there are some trade-offs involved here, but really my goal here is to show you this range of different ESG ETFs to show you that you do have lots of different options. And then really what I do with clients one-on-one -on -one is kind of like figure out, look at them, understand them, figure out which one makes the most sense for you, understanding that there are trade-offs involved here. Now, when it comes to performance, you know, this is what people really, really tend to focus on. Again, from my entire career, there has been this fundamental assumption that by doing responsible investments, that you're somehow sacrificing financial returns. And that just hasn't been the case. You can see here, at least over the last five years where, you know, there have been a lot of these funds on the market. Um, you, you know, you can see the returns over the last three months, the recovery during uh, COVID, sort of the, the COVID recovery, I don't know what we're calling it, the bounce back, whatever's been happening over the last three months that, you know, these responsible investment funds have outperformed. Over the last year, it really is quite striking how well they've done. And then obviously over the last three years or five years. Now, when we look at that one year return, you have to understand that there are some, uh, uh, I would say, you know, trade-offs or there, there are some reasons why these responsible investment funds have outperformed. And people might not like all of them. If we look at the last year, you know, really it is about the decline of uh, the energy sector and fossil fuels. That energy stocks have gotten hit really, really hard over the last little while. And it's known that when it comes to responsible investments, that they tend to have a higher allocation to tech and a lower allocation to energy. That tends, those are the two sectors with sort of the biggest uh, uh, delta or the biggest sort of gap differentiation from the standard benchmark is that these responsible investment funds tend to have more tech and less energy. And you can kind of understand why that would be the case. Well, guess what? Over the last year, you know, tech has done incredibly well from a performance perspective and energy has completely faltered. And there are some questions, you know, ongoing questions now about the health of the energy sector. And so really, you know, understand, I want you to take these performance numbers with a grain of salt. I'm not promising you that responsible investments are gonna continue to outperform now and forever. I don't have the crystal ball, so I don't know what's gonna happen. But what I can show you is at least over the last five years, responsible investments have done just as well, if not better, than traditional investments uh, on the aggregate, and that really you don't have to sacrifice financial returns. That really that's the key thing that I'm getting at, that it's very easy to build a portfolio that is moving you in the right direction, that avoids the sort of worst of the worst companies that actually doesn't sacrifice financial returns. At least that hasn't been the case in Canada over the last five years. Uh, I got this data from the Responsible Investment Association, RIE Canada. So this does look at sort of the, the average uh, responsible investment global equity fund. They do have data for Canadian equity funds. Again, there was an outperformance there, but really what I'm showing you here, I don't want to promise outperformance here, but really know that, that what I can show you is that investors haven't had to sacrifice financial returns.
Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this. You know, I talked about the sector's waiting, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that sustainable companies are more profitable. Uh, one of the best ways that we have is this is data from MSCI, um, where they broke down companies based on these ESG scores, right, into quintiles. So, you know, when we look at the world here, you can see these are companies with a low ESG score versus the leaders with a high ESG score. And as the ESG score improves, you can see that the cost of capital declines. So this is the cost for the company to be able to raise money through the stock market, through the bond market, right? That this is a measure of, of the confidence that, that investors have, right, in terms of the risk profile. So you can see here that the market is rewarding companies with a higher ESG score, that they've got a lower cost of capital, they've got a, a lower cost of equity, and they've got a lower cost of debt. So you can see here, you know, how much it would cost them to raise to, to raise more stock and then how much it would cost them to raise money through bonds. That in both cases, you know, it, it, they do have a lower cost of capital. Now, some would take this to mean that as investors, you are getting a lower return. That if you're investing in these, hey, you know, your interest rate might be lower. And, and I would take that, that, that there is a dynamic there that you have to be a little bit careful about. That said, you know, what this is telling me is that the companies themselves are expected to be more profitable, which to me long term is a fantastic thing for investors. Um, in line with that, there are some other, uh, uh, um, there is more evidence for why these uh, uh, companies are more profitable. Uh, I want to reference here the work of Bob Willard, who's uh, an absolute legend in the space, uh, literally wrote the book on the business case for sustainability. Uh, what he talks about is that companies that are leaders in sustainability are more efficient. They're using less energy, less water, less materials, right? They're more efficient there. They're more productive. The, the employees uh, uh, care about the company, so they're more engaged in the company, and there's less turnover, right? So there are less uh, employees leaving the company, which means that the cost when it comes to hiring and training new employees, right, that cost is much lower for companies that do have uh, uh, workforce that is sort of more loyal to that company. And as well, they are more innovative. You know, I really think that there is, this is a major trend when we look at the way the world is moving. You know, I think there's an understanding that uh, climate change is real and this is important and we need things that are more uh, efficient and that have lower carbon footprints. I also think that more consumers care about where the company, uh, um, you know, where the product comes from and are employees being treated well. And this this idea of innovation in terms of creating uh, uh, that next generation of products. I often use the analogy of LED lights, right? Like remember how it was the incandescent light bulb for the longest time, right? And then we had a brief period where it was those CFL lights and then really it just almost leapfrogged right away into LED lights. And that now there are OLED lights and QLED lights and that these are innovative products that are becoming more efficient and are part of a green economy that companies that understand these issues and are ahead of the curve are much more likely to be the innovators of these new technologies. Uh, so I've largely talked about the financial implications of responsible investing and, and what that looks like. Uh, this is the one slide that I include that does wanna talk about the moral implications here. That, you know, really this does look at carbon footprints. And I know everyone's gonna have different issues that they care about. You know, some people might care more about labor rights uh, some people might care more uh, about uh, uh, e-waste. For me, really, my biggest issue is climate change, that I'm really worried uh, about climate change. And so this infographic, to me, is a stark reminder that if you're not looking at sustainability or ESG, if you just have a very traditional investment portfolio, that by default, the carbon footprint of that portfolio is massive. Now, uh, this was taken in 2008, and uh, uh, the energy sector has declined since then. So these values might be a little bit lower now than they were before. But the methodology used here is that this was a 100% equity portfolio, so just stocks, and they did it 50-50 between Canadian equity and global equity. And the reality is when you look at the Canadian stock market, the TSX, there are a lot of companies in there with very heavy carbon footprints. 
Um, there's a lot of oil and gas. There are a lot of pipelines that does make up uh, a disproportionately high number uh, amount of our traditional uh, in indexes. So, you know, Canadians by default have a really high carbon footprint of their portfolio. And, you know, I don't want to have this as like a silver bullet or a panacea. You know, I still think people should like fly less and definitely think people should ditch their car and ride a bike or get an electric car if you can afford one. And I definitely think people should eat less meat. You know, absolutely. I think these are really important things that we should all be doing. That said, if you're doing these things, if you're like conscious of your carbon footprint when it comes to your consumption habits, but you haven't considered the carbon footprint of your investment portfolio, you know, even with a 100K portfolio, if you've got 100K in stocks, right, that, that basically dwarfs all three of those issues together, right? Let alone if you've got a 500K or a million dollar portfolio. Now, I'm not saying here having a child, you know, obviously we want kids. Kids are a wonderful thing, you know, uh, uh, not suggesting that we should discourage that at all. Um, but really, it is about understanding the impact of our different activities. And if you are an investor, you know, a million dollar portfolio to retire in Canada, you know, if you're approaching retirement or in retirement, you know, you need more than a million dollars to retire comfortably these days. You know, that that the carbon footprint of that portfolio is massive. And I don't think a lot of people really understand or appreciate that. And that once you understand this, you know, really know that it is very, very simple to be able to simply swap out the sort of traditional non-sustainable ETFs for a socially responsible or, or an ESG option. That there are very, very easy ways to be able to reduce this carbon footprint. Uh, from there, you know, really want to talk a moment about my change theory. This is sort of my big picture thesis. That, you know, really this starts with people investing, that when people invest uh, with sustainability in mind with these ESG funds, what that's going to do is going to create a higher demand for companies that have ESG scores, right? So as more people invest in companies and with a strategy that focuses on sustainability leaders, that's going to create higher demand for those uh, stocks. Right. When there's more people buying stocks than selling them, obviously that's going to cause share prices to rise. What when the share prices rise, when I show you that outperformance chart, if that does continue and people can say, whoa, people are making money doing this. Yeah, I would like to, you know, earn earn a higher return and do good in the world. That's going to generate more interest in SRI, which is what we're thinking right now. The responsible investing is just going to become more popular which causes more people to invest. So really, this is kind of my dream, is that we do have this sort of virtuous cycle where people invest according to their values, right? That the companies that they're investing in uh, perform better because there's more demand for their shares, that this is just gonna drive even more demand. Now, obviously at some point here, you gotta be careful because if prices get too high, right? You could have you know, lower expected long-term returns. That if this was sort of the mainstream and your you shift later on after prices have gone up, then obviously you would be buying in at a much higher price. So I do think that, that you know, really for me, this is about understanding that we're in the early stages of this trend. And I am suggesting that, you know, I want pe people to get in early, that I think that uh, uh, the investors have been rewarded by doing things like uh, divesting from fossil fuels, and investing in clean technologies, you know, watching those share prices uh, 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 react in the way that they have. Um, and to show you why I do think we are very much in the early stages uh, of this trend, that you can see here, this is data from a Morningstar. Uh, this is looking at US uh, uh, sustainable funds. So this is just the US market here. Um, what I wanna show is, is these are inflows to sustainable investment funds. And you can see that really they only started collecting data in 2009, that this was very, there were very few products available then. You know, as we go through, you can see it never really got above this $2 billion mark in any quarter, right? And then all of a sudden, 2019, we saw a surge. And we actually saw, I believe it's about $20 billion flow into these sustainable funds in, the, in 2019. And then what's remarkable is that it's only continued here in 2020, that despite 
kind of this has got to be one of the wackiest markets we've ever had. Like 2020 has just been an almost absurd year in the stock market. And despite that, you know, we've already seen more than $20 billion flow into these sustainable funds. So really, I can start to see the momentum rising in the U.S. That said, it's still very early days. The overall market for ETFs in the U.S. is $4 trillion, right? So here I'm talking about, you know, $20 billion out of a $4 trillion market. So, you know, certainly the tidal wave isn't here. This isn't, you know, this is not yet the default way for people to invest. But I can really start to see it shift in this direction, both through these inflows that investors are catching on, but also through a lot of the pensions, uh, Canadian Pension Plan, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, all these major pension plans are now starting to realize the importance of this ESG analysis. And they're all starting to move in this direction. So I still think it's early days in terms of this, this broad transition, but I do feel that the market overall is moving towards this idea of ESG data integration, where the, those ESG data points are going to be relevant factors when it comes to the company's share price. And as the market readjusts, you know, obviously my perspective is that I would want to get in on that early um, as the prices change. So really my mission on a personal level, you know, I've created this big, hairy, audacious goal to help 1 million people invest intentionally. I just want to help people do this. You know, most people have just never heard of this stuff or if they've heard of responsible investments, you know, it's usually from a very negative perspective to say, you know, something that uh, um, that really you're, you know, you have to sacrifice returns or, you know, you're giving up something major in order to do this. And that's just not the case. So, you know, really my mission is to help as many people as possible. That's why I'm here on this webinar. Um, that's why I've built my business, Good Investing, um, as a financial planner. I really, I'm trying to help people uh, get through all the different barriers that they might be facing to help them not only like think about it and consider it, but to actually do it, to actually shift their money into investments that are aligned with their values. Um, and so really, you know, want to come back to this idea of a sustainable portfolio and what this looks like. And so, you know, you can see here, uh, um, you know, if we do have this idea of, of, you know, government bonds and you can have corporate bonds, there actually are these ESG bond fund ETFs now. So we can have a mix of government and corporate bonds still going to be a part of your portfolio, you know, U.S. stocks, international stocks, but then also to talk a little bit about the, the doing more good side of the portfolio with green stocks and impact. So what I've been discussing so far on the ESG side really is kind of these more standard approaches where, you know, you're still going to have these large multi-billion dollar companies, right? You're just getting rid of the things you don't want exposure to. And that could be for ethical grounds. You want to get rid of sectors entirely, things like tobacco or weapons or fossil fuels as well. It could be using this ESG uh, approach saying, you know, I want to get rid of the bottom 20% of companies across every sector, or I want to get rid of the bottom half of companies by ESG score across all sectors. And then from there, what we can do is start to talk about the doing more good stuff. And this is what gets me really excited. And, you know, when it comes to the doing more good options, these are the things that I really love um, to me, these, these get me going. So there are uh, a fair number of green ETFs. Uh, there are a number, there are probably like, you know, seven or eight now renewable energy ETFs. Um, so lots of different ways to be able, be able to invest in renewable energy. Uh, there's an ETF from iShares that links to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it's called the Global Impact ETF, super cool. This is a, an ETF linked to those Sustainable Development Goals. And water infrastructure, uh, you know, to me, water is a really important theme moving forward. Understanding climate change, um, you know, I think there's a, a really huge opportunity here when uh, uh, countries and, and municipalities are really forced to upgrade their water infrastructure. Uh, obviously, I want to be investing in a lot of the solutions, things that are, that are going to be preventing climate change. But it's also understanding that, you know, as, as climate change happens, and it is happening, that that is going to put a strain on our water systems and is likely going to require further investment there. So these are all going to be like equity ETFs. You know, they are going to have a different risk profile. This is why I don't suggest you do all of your money. You know, I really want you to be deliberate and carve out part of your portfolio for these sort of green sectors. 
Um, you, what we're doing here is investing in things that, A, we feel good about, that kind of hopefully give you some sort of warm fuzzies that, yeah, these are things I want to cheer for, but also things that we feel are going to outperform as the economy shifts in a more sustainable direction. So these are sectors and companies where we want to get out ahead of the curve. Um, you know, again, there is the, the, the fear that some of these companies might get overvalued. Tesla would be a wonderful example. Um, if you haven't seen Tesla, I'm happy to, to address it. the share price in the Q&A that Tesla has just gone up by so much. So, you know, there is the possibility of sort of a green bubble. That said, you know, Tesla, I really feel is an outlier that when it comes to a lot of these sectors, I do think that they have tremendous growth potential and still have a lot of room to run in terms of their, uh, uh, their growth. Uh, as well, when it comes to this idea of impact investing, these are gonna be more on the debt side of it. So these are more like bonds with community bonds and green bonds and microfinance. To me, this is what really gets me going because we're not buying shares from another investor. This is where we're actually uh, uh, loaning money directly to nonprofits and co-ops and micro lending organizations where we're, we're getting uh, cash into the hands of organizations that are gonna be able to do good with it. Um, there are some great examples of community bonds um, here in uh, Canada. We've had the Center for Social Innovation, CSI, where I, that's where I operate out of. It's a co-working space in Toronto. Uh, they've done two community bond raises. Um, I actually think they just, they might've just finished their third raise, which is fantastic. Um, there's also a group called Sketch, uh, which is doing some really cool things. Uh, green bonds, so lots of different options there um, when it comes to organizations. But again, these are going to be uh, direct loans to projects um, that are pushing forward renewable energy and energy efficiency um, that are going to have a nice payback. You sort of, you know, you have to build the project up front and then you get cash flow. And so they take that cash flow from those projects and use that to pay you interest on your bonds. And then microfinance is about access to capital for the world's poorest, that there are still a lot of people in this world that do not have access to traditional finance. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have access to mortgages and, and small business loans. So really what we're doing here is going international and uh, loaning money to organizations that have these lending circles that have sort of boots on the ground in uh, a lot of countries that are able to uh, issue these micro loans um, that really have the the potential to change people's lives, um, which is a really cool thing. Um, so really, there are lots and lots of uh, options. Again, I don't think you should put all of your money into these things that they do come with their own unique risks that are really important to evaluate. But these are things that, you know, it provided you have a nice balanced portfolio. You can carve out part of your portfolio for these doing more good options. Um, and to me, you know, this is just a wonderful way to be able to have a positive impact with our investment portfolio. Uh, so really, that's it for me. Like I said, I want to have the Q&A. So I really want to open it up to questions um, that, that I'm happy to sort of, you know, I've got my screen shared so I can show you different things. If you want to look at some of the green ETFs or some of the impact investments or, you know, whatever is really sort of a, a top of mind for you. Uh, if you want to dig into ESG scores, I'm happy to show you some other practical examples. Really know that I'm here and sort of happy to make myself available for the next little bit uh, to be able to answer any and all of your questions. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, it was really, really great. I uh, really appreciate that uh, educational, engaging content. I know I learned a lot and, and there's a ton of great feedback uh, coming in in the comments and the chat. Um, we do have a bunch of questions as well. So if you have a few minutes uh, to address some of those, um, I'm happy to uh, to facilitate here. It might be a bit of a rapid fire round. I hope that's okay for you. I'm fine. No worries. We, we can do a, a, a lightning round. I dig it. Excellent. Okay. Um, the one, one, this one is a little bit uh, maybe broader, but one thing that kind of has came up in a few comments and questions throughout is, um, you know, you mentioned you've been in this space for over 10 years, almost 15 years now since you've done your master's. Um, and can you speak to a little bit of, of how that's changed? I know you said when you started out, you were a little bit early. And then uh, in one of your later slides, you showed how the fund flows 
have just exploded uh, relative to where they were prior. Um, can you just talk a little bit about sort of the the trend overall of, of the changes you've seen in the last 10 years and maybe where you think it might go 10 years hence? How is this a lightning round question? This is like <laughs> my, I need like a full, okay, I'll do my best here. But basically, um, I, you know, it's when I started this, people thought I was nuts. Like nobody knew what I was talking about. When I came home from Sweden and I started talking about socially responsible and sustainable investing, nobody had any clue what I was talking about. Like it was really challenging for me. Um, and I found that, you know, really it was it, it, the people had blinders on. And honestly thought I was a little bit nuts. You know, I, I would often get called like a tree hugger or a hippie. Like it really was, people thought this was a very sort of radical idea that had no place in the world of finance. Um, and now the conversation has completely changed that this is now so mainstream. Now, Canada is far behind on this. Okay. So, you know, really it's, it's understanding that, that we are, I would say, dragging our feet that when I, if I were to show you those inflows for the Canadian funds, you know, when it's not impressive. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these ETFs still do have fairly low assets under management, the ones domiciled in Canada. But in the U.S., this is a huge topic. I mean, I remember, do you know uh, Jim Cramer from Mad mm -hmm. Money, if people know who he is? And I'm sure everyone has opinions about Jim Cramer, but he has a huge influence. He's a big voice. And, you know, he came out earlier this year pre-COVID and said, fossil fuels are dead, that he won't go near fossil fuels. And it was because young people just won't touch them, that he recognized that fossil fuel divestment is just now absolutely mainstream. And when I watch CNBC, you know, and, and they're doing their analysis, I now hear about ESG investing and ESG funds and what they're doing you know, just as a, as a matter of course. So to me, it's just been this incredible shift in psychology. And again, I think so much of it has to do with this assumption that responsible investments underperform, that that assumption just allowed people to completely dismiss it and ignore it and sort of wave it away. But now as we're seeing all this data that's saying, ooh, actually, you know, they're doing just as well. Ooh, actually, they've done better as energy has faltered and technology has risen. Now, all of a sudden, I think a lot of, of, of mainstream investors are taking a, a good, hard, long look at this mm -hmm. and asking questions that they never would have asked themselves 10 years ago. So, you know, I still think we're in like the second inning or the third inning of a baseball game here. You know, this is really like I, this. I'm not I still recognize that I'm a bit of an outlier, especially in Canada, talking about these issues. But, you know, really, I would urge people the proof is in the pudding. Like, look at the returns. I understand the more you read about this, the more you understand this, the more you start to realize that this is a very rational approach when it comes to long term investing. Fantastic. Uh, no, that's that's it's really helpful um, to have that that sort of longer term view. Um, all right, now getting into to more rapid fire things. Uh, there's a bunch of questions just coming in, uh, so I just want to reconfirm that we will be sending out a, a recording. Um, so for those that have questions about particular ETFs that were mentioned in your slides, they'll be able to to reference those. There's one question, Tim. Can you remind us what was the UN linked uh, development goal ETF? Which one that yeah, was? Yeah, absolutely. So here, why don't I just bring it up? Hopefully, you should be able to to see my browser yep. now. Great. So I can just show you. So this is the ticker symbol is SDG as in sustainable development goals. So this is the iShares MSCI Global Impact ETF. Uh, it's done very well. You can see the year to date, you know, this is since Jan 1. So the performance on this, I don't want to get too much into performance because some of them are so good. I'm like, it almost feels like snake oil here. But, you know, it's really cool. You can see here that what they do here is they target companies with leading ESG business practices. So companies must have an MSCI ESG score of triple B or better. So it gets rid of the worst of the worst. And then also build their business around products and services that may drive positive change. So basically, these are companies that drive more than half of their revenues from products and services that are linked to one or more of the sustainable development goals. Uh, I want to be clear, this isn't like a crunchy granola, you know, this isn't like, you know, <laughs> nonprofits and, you know, the that side of sustainable development. These are publicly traded companies. So just to give people a feel of the top 10 holdings, like Tesla is like one of the reasons why this has done so well, as mm -hmm. well as Neo, which is a Chinese electric car company, 
right? So that's one of the reasons why performance has been so good. But it's also going to have wind turbines, uh, Procter and Gamble. You know, they do a lot of stuff around soaps and sanitation. <laughs> it would fall under well-being. Pearson, which is education, obviously a, a big sustainable development goal. And Suez, which is a water utility. So that would fall under access <laughs> to water. Just to give people like a smattering of the types of companies that are in here. Yeah, no, this is a very helpful kind of educational example. Um, and I think you caveated the, the performance uh, <laughs> quite a bit already. Um, the So this this leads into another question, Tim. People were asking um, where they can, if they're looking at an ETF, how can they understand um, the carbon footprint of the ETF? Um, w whether that involves like looking at the underlying stocks or if there's a place they can go. Great. It's very easy. So there are two sources. Now, Morningstar has been a little bit tricky for me, but let's see if it works. So for example, I'll just use that SDG just because we were just looking at it. Mm -hmm. uh, see, it's unfortunately for whatever reason, I'm finding Morningstar just seems to be busted. Let me see if Morningstar.com works. Otherwise I can, uh, uh, there is another source from MSCI but I do tend to show both. I do find it's nice to have sort of like the two different data points, um, but let me see if morningstar.com works. And if I click on the portfolio tab here, this does look like it's populating and it should be down here. So they do give me two uh, uh, pieces. One is the the, mm -hmm. the the ESG risk factor. So we want a lower score here. Right. So it does show me the ESG breakdown. But really what they're asking about are these carbon metrics. So you can see right away that this gives me this carbon risk score. And it also gives me fossil fuel involvement. Right. And so this is going to be now it's interesting that it does have a little bit here. This would probably be companies like that Suez, those water utilities. You know, they might also have some some natural gas plants or something like that. So, you know, again, it's going to be tricky. You always need to look at it. Uh, just to give people an idea of what I was discussing in terms of the Canadian market. Now, oh, is it not going to give me? Oh, the, oh because I'm on. Oh, uh, well, I can't look up the the Canadian fund there. Okay, can't, the Toronto stock market gets off the hook right now, just because I can't do that. <laughs> uh, let me, sorry, just do this, and then what I can do is show you MSCI ESG fund ratings. Oh, so great. this is the other source from MSCI, and again, these are free tools. It's just that nobody really knows them that they exist. And then if I look at, sorry, SGD, um, it should pop up here. Not, hold on. Sustain, sorry, SDG. There we go. Where are you, iShares? <laughs> That's funny that it's not coming up here. Uh, okay, well, this is one where, you know, maybe I can do VCN. Will it pop up? Sorry, I mean, you know, I think with a lot of these, it is tricky msci global impact etf it's not giving me anything sorry i'm having uh, uh some issues with their database let me just try yeah that's but that really these are the two resources that i use sure uh, tim morningstar and then uh msci okay huh. great there uh, is one other that i should be able to get it's just fossil fuelfree.org, I believe. Let me just try this. No, um, sorry, it's uh, as you so. Oh yes, I'm familiar with. Uh... Have you? Yeah. So they have a really cool site. Again, this is only going to be for U.S. stuff. And again, it's just not like you have to know exactly where to go. So you go to like asyouso.org, and then it's uh, invest your values. And here's where they have fossilfreefunds.org. Oh, yeah. And again, you know, this would, I'm hoping that SDG is going to show up here. Oh, there it was. Yeah. And then again, you know, this is a resource that is going to take all of those underlying assets. You can see here, you know, that on the fossil fuel side, it gets a B, no major things. You can see here, you know, I'm not surprised, fossil fired utilities. So a little bit of natural gas, it actually tells me specifically what the utilities are and that this gets like four out of five. I think they do have a specific carbon footprint metric. So the way that we tend to measure it is the tons of CO2 per million dollars uh, USD invested. So this is kind of the standard benchmark. Really, the you know uh, MSCI we should be able to get that. Morningstar we should be able to get that. And you know this as you so um, website really does an incredible job. 
Oh, great. No, that's uh, thanks for all of these resources. I think, you know, uh, that was the sentiment I was getting from a lot of the chat questions is that uh, folks are keen to uh, maybe look at what they own already or start looking at new ideas. Um, so it seems like between MSCI, Morningstar and, and fossil free, free funds, um, there's a number of tools to look at the, um, I guess, relative impact of different funds and ETFs, whether those are mutual funds um, or not. And then uh, right. on the invest with your values uh, tab there, Tim, I saw that there was a couple other um, kind of categories beyond fossil yeah. fuels. Um, yeah. And that sort of had me back to another question that came in, which is, you know, this doesn't really, I guess, uh, you know, values at the end of the day are somewhat personal and, and different people might have different ideas of what necessarily fits into a SRI in their minds. Um, yeah. So I guess, is, is there any sort of advice you would have? Um, you know, I don't suppose there's a one size fits all approach, or maybe that's that's what you do with your team is help people think through the the nuances a little bit more um, of their own, I guess. Can you speak to that a little bit of how yeah, different I mean, kind of themes uh, are emerging? That's the, the, that's, it's honestly, it's the hardest part of what I do is that everyone has such a different idea of what this means. And that really what I suggest people do is just start learning. And as you go through the funds, if you look at the methodology, you'll start to get a feel for it and understand which issues are most important to you, which ones resonate. And then also when you look at the companies inside the fund, that people just tend to have like a very visceral reaction mm -hmm. to specific companies. And for everyone, it's different. You know, for everyone, it's different. Um, the common ones are going to be these quote unquote sin stocks. So as you sow, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of this uh, social responsible investing started within the religious communities. Right. So you understand that there are these quote unquote sin stocks, right? Weapons, tobacco, um, uh, 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 alcohol, uh, pornography. Those were the very traditional ones that now really fossil fuel free is, I would say, the big trend, the big thing that people are now really looking at the carbon footprint, that that one has just emerged so rapidly over the last little bit. You know, it's interesting, the gender equality funds that this had, I would say, a moment, you know, probably about two years ago where gender equality was just super important. And with Me Too and with, you know, discrimination and just understanding how bad the financial industry, you know, boards of directors, I think there's like one female CEO in Canada right now out of the top 100 companies. Like, it's just absurd. But then, you know, it was interesting to see that, sadly, that issue did sort of, you know, fade away. And then earlier this year, we saw racial equality really spike up, that with massive protests in the U.S., and people really ask me, Tim, well, what about, you know, racial equality? How does that fit in to ESG? So, you know, it, it's, it really is interesting, but it is so much around awareness and, and a little bit of introspection and understanding which issues really matter to you. And I want to be clear that I've stopped kind of pushing my values onto other people. You know, I've really, I never tell people what to do or how they should do it or, you know, what's good or bad. Instead, really, my job is to help people understand what these issues are and really choose for themselves where they want to draw that line in the sand. And for everyone, it's going to be different, but there are definitely some, I would say, controversial or kind of benchmark companies mm -hmm. that I use. Nestle was one for a long time, you know, with the water and, you know, people just seem to hate Nestle. Right now, uh, Amazon seems to be a very controversial company where, you know, people are either like, well, but I use it and it's a great service and they're taking over the world. And then some people are just like, oh, no, they treat their employees so poorly and they're destroying mom and pop shops and, you know, really, really divided when it comes to Amazon. So, you know, really, it's it's fascinating for me. You can see why the sort of philosopher in me loves what I do so much, that there is a lot of economics, there is a lot of number crunching, and there is a lot of, you know, understanding these different issues from more quantitative perspective. But at the end of the day, it really is going to be this very subjective sort of philosophic question about, you know, what are you prepared to sort of hold, plug your nose and invest in? And which companies or which sectors are just an absolutely hard line no for you? And I can't answer that. Each person has to do it individually. Well said. That uh, sounds like maybe somebody who uh, had a philosophy degree 
I, I think that's a, a really great perspective, uh, Tim, and, and very helpful. And I, I appreciate there's there's no one size fits all, but a little bit of, of introspection um, goes a long way. Now, I just wanted to jump back into the ESG data. We're still getting a bunch of questions about that. So we've covered, uh, we've looked at where folks can find ETFs in mutual fund uh, data, but there, I, I missed, there were some questions about um, for a specific stock. I think you used Apple as an example earlier. Yeah. Uh, people were just curious, you know, if they wanted to look up a stock, where should they go to, to kind of see so that similar? MSCI just has their, these aren't the okay, ESG great. fund ratings. These are just ESG ratings. So you can see how awesome it is here. So okay. MSCI.com MSCI slash ESG dash ratings. And this is where I pulled my data from. You can see my little screenshots there. And then what's cool is that Sustainalytics uh, just recently uh, I'll publish theirs for free, which I just found this like this week. So, um, you know, Morningstar is where I go to for funds. So, you know, ETFs and mutual funds, they're great for that when the data does populate. Um, but for individual <laughs> companies, I couldn't get the Sustainalytics. Uh, I could get it through Yahoo. Yahoo does give me like a very, I would say, small sort of overview which is kind of cool. Um, and they pull it from Sustainalytics. Oops, where did it go? I don't care about Fortnite. There we go. <laughs> so here we go. You know, you can see here Apple's ESG ratings. Now, again, with this uh, 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 Sustainalytics or now Morningstar, you know, a lower score is better. So, you know, 33rd percentile means they're in the sort of best third. And they do have very low environment score, but a fairly high social score, a fairly high governance score. And then what's cool is that they do also have these screens here for product involvement areas. So hmm. Apple obviously is not going to be involved in any of these major things, right? But, um, you know, if there was, if I very specifically wanted to avoid pesticides or palm oil, Catholic values, you know, it's the only one that gets the question mark. This is abortion, contraceptives, uh, stem cell and fetal tissue research. Again, you know, hmm. I'm not going to, you know, necessarily agree with all that all of these things are bad but the information is there for people who want it. And then, you know, really this week, it was just so cool for me to see that I can get it from directly from Sustainalytics. Uh, the way they report it is a little bit different than what it looks like on Yahoo. But I can see here that again, you know, a lower score is better, that Apple is sort of middle of the pack, that in their technology hardware, again, sort of middle of the pack. And this is the global universe, you know, slightly ahead of the pack. Oh, great. Oh, perfect. And is there a view of the pack? Uh, or so put another way, one of the questions we've gotten is um, if people are essentially asking if there's a screening tool or a list of sort of the maybe top rated 100 companies or something where they could go pull um, companies that sure. kind of meet this definition. Uh, That's right. So really your best friend there when it comes to researching these individual companies are going to be to find like, I would say like the most sustainable ETFs and then scrape their holdings. So like if we're talking about U.S. equity, you know, on my list, the most sort of sustainable one is going to be this change finance ETF. Um, so this is, you know, a uh, uh, very cool uh, change finance U.S. large cap fossil fuel free ETF. This is in U.S. dollars. So this is a U.S. one. But you can see it does, you know, basically screen out a bunch of different things here. And then from there, what's great about ETFs is the transparency. So I can just get like a full list of the holdings, right? And I can just like open it up in Excel. And now I get the full list of their holdings. Now, again, this is kind of a doing less harm or sort of like mm -hmm. getting rid of the worst. So I don't want to pretend that these are like the best of the best. But, you know, this is going to give me a really great list. Of, I think this has like 100 companies in here in terms of the US, you know, these would be some of the top and they would certainly get rid of the worst. Now, there are going to be companies in here that people are like, hey, like Walt Disney, really, really, Tim, Walt Disney, <laughs> you know, but again, understand the methodology, understand the CSG approach, understand that, you know, the, the sort of the screens and then that ESG analysis. I'm not surprised that Walt Disney is in here at all. Um, another resource that can be really helpful is especially here in Canada is um, uh, 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 Corporate Nights. Um, so Corporate Nights, and they do this every year, they do this global 100 list. And so this is, they've got their own data and methodology. So they actually compile this on their own, but they do have this global 100 ranking. 
and index of the world's most sustainable corporations. Now there is going to be energy in here. There is going to be mining. So again, not everyone's going to agree, but like if I had to find a list of like the most sustainable companies in the world, you know, this is probably one of my starting points. Oh, fantastic. Great. Um, no, the, this is, is very helpful and, uh, you know, the, the ETF methodology makes sense too. Um, I think, uh, there, there is, are still lots of questions coming in, but, uh, I don't want to, uh, take up our break am, afternoon. So I am happy to go. I mean, it's really on you. You know, if, if we do want to call this on time, that's fine, but I'm happy to go five minutes over if, if that would be helpful. Sure. No, that, I, I appreciate it, Tim. So um, let's do uh, one more here, uh, and I think it'll be a nice little wrap up. Um, there was a lot of interest in the Canadian couch potato slide that you showed, sure. uh, and people are very you know, interested in sort of, uh, I think that kind of passive hands-off index portfolio based approach and, and right. sort of thinking about sustainable investing as it fits into their overall asset allocation. Um, do you have any like you know, I know you have your blog, Sustainable Economist. Do you have any websites or uh, or is good investing where people should go? Like, you know, if someone wanted to sort of yeah. uh, like go a little bit further and, and you know, beyond just looking up a, a stock or a fund, if they really wanted to, to get started kind of investing uh, this way or, or learning about what those steps would be to, to put a model portfolio together, is there a, yeah, something you recommend as a next step? Absolutely. So I've come up with model portfolios. These are on my blog. Uh, I need to admit my blog it's a little bit out of date that, you know, you can sort of see the grainy. Uh, I created this in, I think it was 2012 or 2013. So, you know, turned myself into Superman and had some fun with it. Uh, and I'm going to be moving everything over to my goodinvesting.com website. That's sort of a summer project for me that, that I'm working towards that. And in, I'll, I'll also be updating all of these model portfolios. But, you know, for people who want, you know, that couch potato approach, what I did is this was one of my first uh, model portfolios. I call it the organic couch potato portfolio. Um, <laughs> you know, really, and again, this is a little bit out of date, you know, for Canadian equity, I do have the Jancy Social Index. There are now cheaper, lower cost ETFs than this. There are also Canadian dollar options for US equity, international equity, and this is uh, EAFE and emerging markets. But, you know, really these model portfolios are going to be probably like the best sort of starting point um, to be able to do the research. I do have hyperlinks to them and I do have little descriptions. Uh, the other place where uh, I am spending time and if people do have more questions, uh, they're welcome to follow my YouTube channel that uh, I've been doing these live shows. I'm actually going to okay. do one this Thursday where I just basically, uh, uh, you know, do Q&A and go, go through things. I've got my model portfolio performance, if you're curious about this. Uh, my most popular video so far is when Wellsimple launched their new responsible portfolio. So doing that. Okay. So again, I'm going to be sort of rebranding and, and doing everything is good investing. But I do have this YouTube and um, I do uh, have these ETF reviews. So for example, you know, the Horizon Sustainability Leaders ETF, this is part of my squeaky clean portfolio. So I can just show people here that like this is really for, you know, is a very sort of squeaky clean approach. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, I've got this model portfolio, but they did update the methodology. So sadly, again, my blog is a little bit out of date here because it said it only had 100 companies where now they've actually updated it and it's got 200 companies in there. So mm -hmm. here I did a little sort of an update and explained how the ETF sort of changed their methodology. And, you know, my thoughts on that as well. You can see here things like the NAACP Minority Empowerment ETF, which is very cool. Uh, there was iShares uh, did, I'm not sure where that one is, um, but there was uh, 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 iShares launched new uh, uh, fossil fuel free ETFs. So here they are, the iShares ESG Advanced ETF. So these are going to be a little bit more sort of in-depth guides. Uh, what I'm really hoping to do is to continue to grow my business. Um, that that uh, I want to be able to create sort of a, a nice online portal through good investing that will have all of these model portfolios um, and then also will then link to YouTube ETF reviews. So obviously there's a lot of work to be done there. I don't want people to expect that this is going to happen overnight, but this is the type of work that, that I'm working on. 
Oh, fantastic. No, this is uh, this is very helpful. And I think uh, the perfect sort of next step that people were looking for, if they wanted to learn more, they can uh, check out your YouTube channel or website. Um, and your, as you, you said, this Thursday, you have a live uh, show coming up? Yeah, that's right. I am going to do a show uh, Thursday, I believe at noon. I don't know if right. I've uh, uh, put it up here yet. But um, yeah, that is, uh, I haven't launched it. But yeah, I am going to be going live Thursday at noon. Um, if, if people are curious to, to tune in and that, you know, I do tend to, again, have a lot of questions for uh, a lot of time for questions and Q and a, so I really love this sort of dynamic. I think people have a lot of questions about this stuff. Right. And I think that these practical examples are super, super helpful. So I really love this mm -hmm. idea of being able to, you know, have, have a forum where people can ask questions and I'll do my best to answer them. No, oh, fantastic. Uh, Really appreciate it, Tim, and, and thanks so much for uh, the time and attention and expertise today. It, uh, the presentation was great, and then having you sort of walk through some of the steps here in terms of how to apply this information is is really helpful. So, you know, <clears throat> on behalf of QuestCreate, I just you know really want to say thank you for for all of this knowledge and all of this expertise. We're excited to help get the word out, and and to everyone that attended today, thank you for taking the time, and, and I hope you found this helpful. And with that, we will uh, wrap up today's webinar. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, we'll be sending you a recording later this week. So keep an eye on your email inbox. And thanks again, Tim, very much. Uh, this was wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. Great. That'll conclude today's webinar. Thanks, everyone.